So hi everyone and welcome to today's session about clinical hypnotherapy in dentistry. Before starting, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Munir Ravalia, qualified from the Royal London Hospital in 2002. He completed training as a senior house officer in oral and maxillofacial surgery. He is currently a trust dentist and a clinical lecturer in conscious sedation at the Royal London Hospital and the Eastman. In addition to his formal training, Dr. Munir has been trained in acupuncture for the head and neck region and obtained a medical diploma in clinical hypnosis. Dr. Munir, we are happy for having you with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Shall I, um, would you like me to share my, share my screen? Yes, please. Thank you. Great, can you see that now? Yes, all is fine, thank you. You can start the session, please. Thank you. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and um, Dr. Sarah has been very helpful um, in uh, achieving us uh, to allow us to do this um, talk today. So today, even though the title, I've entitled it Hypnosedation, we'll be looking at um, what hypnotherapy is. Um, and before I continue, just like to say bonjour, hello, namaste, salam, wherever you are around the globe. Um, thanks for joining me. I always like to look at these as learning platforms where we can hopefully exchange ideas um, because I think global input into any subject really enriches it. And I know there are many of my global, global uh, colleagues um, that are working hard in this field to really make the patient experience and also the dentist experience um, much nicer in the environment we work in because we know most patients do have some sort of level of anxiety and fear of us as a dentist. So the more we can do to alleviate, the better really. <clears throat> so people will just sort of ask what, what exactly is hypnosis? What is hypnotherapy? And understandably, most of our information we get from the internet, what we see on TV and shows, um, and a lot of that is what they call stage hypnosis. And there are different elements, obviously, to stage hypnosis as opposed to clinical hypnotherapy, where we are utilizing it as a therapy, and hence it's called hypnotherapy. Um, there are obviously overlaps in the way you make someone into the very deep relaxed state, but all you need to think of it is the medicine of the imagination. I really love that term. Because when a patient comes to see you with their dental problem, uh, and I sort of like to coin the phrase where patients come to us with life and not just teeth. And, you know, I think this is very important for us as clinicians to, when we talk about looking after the patient holistically um, and looking after them as human beings, you know, a lot of times I say the teeth come with them a story. So everyone's life story, the different regions they have come from in the world. I mean, London's a very cosmopolitan place. So we have we have people from all over the globe and, you know, depending on where you are, regardless of where people are, they will still come with their story, their life story. People will have different ages, different life um, styles, different social backgrounds, different ethnicities, different languages, different cultures, different food habits. And all of these affect, obviously, the oral cavity in the mouth we deal with as dentists, but they also influence the uh, the patient's mind. And a lot of times I find being a dentist is not only doing the dentistry, a lot of times you're sort of acting as a psychologist, a bit of a psychiatrist, you know, using different techniques that either you've picked up yourself or learned in dental school or, you know, just gone to learn formally or informally outside of um, the dental institutions that we, we learn things. So I've taken on a journey where I like to really work with individuals, human beings who maybe have suffered from life traumas or experienced some sort of life trauma. And it's amazing by overcoming those things, it makes their dental journey easier because if someone has a general anxiety of fear in life, for whatever reason, there are multiple reasons, then when they attend to see the doctor, see the dentist, that becomes even more traumatic for them. And if you can help them through that journey, then you know, you can really um, be an amazing clinician in terms of not the dentistry only, but in helping people as individuals and human beings. So I'd like to sort of coin that term medicine of the imagination. Just think of that 
And I'll show you basically how you as an individual, how we as individuals, we go into state of hypnosis every single day. Um, and a lot of times when I introduce hypnotherapy, hypnosis to patients, we don't even need to use those terms. We can use the terms like guided imagery. Psychologists use the term guided imagery. Um, and we can also use the term, for example, deep relaxation. So we don't even need to go and use those formal words, but the principles um, are, are the same, really. So if we look at the states of the mind, if we think of uh, an, an iceberg, you know, so the top level above the water is what's, the, what's what we're in now, the conscious mind. And then there are two levels from that, the unconscious mind, which can obviously be uh, induced artificially. For example, if someone is going under general anesthesia, they will be unconscious and a machine will be breathing for them, helping them to keep them alive. But the other state in between these two, and it's kind of a state when you're, if you think of it, when you're feeling a bit sleepy, so you're not fully awake, you're not fully asleep and you enter this subconscious state of mind. And we all do this every single day. Also people who practice prayer, mindfulness, meditation, they'll find it much easier to enter this state. And it's a bit like daydreaming. So, you know, you may be working in the day or just relaxing at home, watching a movie maybe. And, you know, your mind wanders. You, you, you imagine things and maybe there's people around you talking, but you can't remember. They come in and say, oh, didn't you listen to what I was saying? And you, you were kind of there. You weren't fully asleep, but you weren't fully awake. And you were probably in that subconscious state. And this is the state of um, hypnosis or where hypnotherapists will want their patient to be in. Because this state is a very relaxed state. And it therefore allows the suggestions of the hypnotherapist to work very comfortably. And it allows the mind just to relax because the world is so fast paced. The world is so busy. You know, we've got 101 things to do. We've got bills to pay. You know, we've got to be with friends, with family, with loved ones. There's so many things going on that the mind just needs a break. It's a bit of a, like a relaxation, a bit of meditation time, just away from the world. And that's why people benefit from things like prayer and med meditation. You know, they find it very useful because it's sort of drowning out all the background noise. And this is what we do in hypnotherapy. We, we push out all the background noise and let the patient really focus. So if we were to really define, you know, uh, if we were to use sort of some more, more concise terms of what, what exactly hypnotherapy is, it's basically using the power of the positive suggestions to guide that individual and bring about the subconscious changes that the patient wasn't able to make in the conscious mind. So for example, somebody who wants to stop smoking, let's take that as an example, you know, they've been smoking and, you know, people around them say it's, it's bad for them. They, many, many doctors, many dentists smoke and they know it's bad for them. They know the effects, the lung problems you can get, the, for us as dentists, we've seen the oral cancer people can get, but people still do it because in the conscious mind, it's much harder or it takes much longer. It's not that no one can change. Of course, people can change. But the change time element is much, much more prolonged. Whereas if you can take someone into the state of the subconscious, so an altered state of consciousness, so you relax the critical part of the mind. Because in a smoker, for example, what their mind, their critical mind will tell them is, well, I enjoy smoking. You know, I go to meet my friends at the pub or at the restaurant and some people associate things with smoking so for example they'll associate it with going to meet friends after work that's a relaxing time some people may drink alcohol with it so they associate different things that make them feel nice so their mind tells them well why do i need to stop even though they know the detrimental physiological effects and the, the dangers of it they still do it and that's what's called the the critical mind it criticizes them and saying well you're having fun, you're enjoying yourself. Why do you want to stop it? So it's very hard for the individual to make a change. Whereas if you take someone into the state of the subconscious the hypn with hypnotherapy, hypnosis, they become much more aware and focused on the job at hand. So they may go and see a hypnotherapist for stopping smoking. You know, and I've seen this with a friend of mine, a heavy smoker for a long period of time, wasn't really interested in smoke in stopping. But he came to a point where he wanted to make the change. And obviously, hypnosis, hypnotherapy, it only works if that individual wants to make the change. So if they don't want to stop smoking, yet their, their mother tells them they must stop smoking or their wife or whatever, the hypnosis will not work. They have to obviously want to make that change. 
but they need a little push. So in the subconscious mind, it allows then the therapist to implant in their mind suggestions to make them overcome it. And we can see very successful global leaders in this field, you know, making rapid change and stopping people from smoking, drinking, drug taking, whatever their problem was that they went to in sometimes one session, you know, and this can be sometimes achieved over three to four sessions with different people, depending on obviously their other elements um, or life issues that they may have that may need to be worked in conjunction, but it's very powerful technique and it's used globally from uh, many problems, but obviously we're gonna look at this in the dental terms. So if we look, for example, this is an anxiety management pathway. So this is a, one of the um, governmental national health trusts in the United Kingdom. And, you know, patients who may be referred in from their dentist in the general practice for um, treatment under sedation, conscious sedation, there will be various elements that sort of rungs on a ladder, steps on a ladder that patients may be um, provided with different techniques. So, for example, clinical behavior shaping. CBT is very powerful as well. It's another psychotherapeutic um, assistance for the patient. So, hypnotherapy falls under that category. And patients may also, for example, if someone has a pronounced gag reflex, they find they can't have the dental instruments, but they're not actually scared of the dentist, but they fear sort of choking, the water in the mouth, all the instruments in the mouth, they can have, you know, acts the certain acupuncture or acupressure points that can really benefit them. And in this pathway, we can see sort of on the right-hand side, hypnosis is one of those pathways. And then depending on page, how patients respond to that or they want for any of these helps. They can go into having treatment with just local anesthesia, uh, maybe with nitrous oxide, the inhalation sedation, you know, the little gas mask. Or there are obviously people who may need to have some sort of intravenous sedation. And maybe there's patients, I mean, we see patients that have the inability to, um, to consent, inability to speak. They may have severe mental um, uh, health needs. Um, and they, those patients may even require general anesthesia. It's not the first line of call, but obviously some patients who just can't consent and need the medical world to help them make those decisions, then sometimes they're very complex to manage and they can have general anesthesia. But we try and do things in a stepwise manner. So using non-pharmacological techniques is obviously better for everyone. There are also cost savings in any um, governmental system and obviously cost savings for the patient long run. And hopefully the aim to use the non-pharmacological methods to allow that patient to overcome their anxiety and fear so they can then have their general dental um, treatment done under local anesthesia with their own dentist. And we try and obviously discharge these patients back because that's the best for them in the long run. Staying in a hospital environment is not the best thing long-term for anyone it, it does, and it doesn't work or serve any purpose. So what are the fundamental aims we're trying to do with patients using a technique like hypnotherapy is to reset the neural pathways which we, we become conditioned in response to a trigger so what i mean by that if we take an example if someone let's take an example of someone as a child uh, let's say they had a fearful dental experience so that's a lived experience they've felt the pain and at that time anything that associated around it so for example if if the dentist was wearing a white coat or a blue coat, if it was a hot day, a cold day, certain smells, certain sounds, if there was certain music playing, all these things would have entered the patient's mind and then they will now associate all those different kinesthetic sounds, sights, colors to that trauma. So for example, the next time they close their eyes, they're at home, they're not even at the dentist, but they think of the dentist, all these factors will come to play back in their mind. So they are reliving the trauma. And this is kind of like a bit of a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, in terms where they, the right side of the brain doesn't process this trauma. And it doesn't get stored on the left side through the amygdala. So it becomes a livid experience. So every time they come and see you as a dentist, they may be shaking, holding onto the chair. You know, different things of you may may trigger again that, that feeling of fear they may start sweating their pulse will increase they'll have an increased heart rate their blood pressure would increase and you know they may if you suddenly say to them look we need to give you an, an injection and they 
had a traumatic experience, they, they may just break down and start crying. They may say, I can't do this and leave the room. And that's not their fault because they've actually lived an experience. They haven't been allowed to, the brain hasn't allowed them to process that. So what we need to do through this process is reset the pathway, reset these neural pathways so that that lived experience becomes a memory now. So when they think of it next time, it's like a memory, just like a good memory. You can plant it into the bank of the mind, the good and bad memories, and not allow it to become a lived experience every single time they think of it, because then they will never be able to overcome their dental or, or medical or whatever anxiety um, have, that they face. And this obviously can take time with people. And it's a bit like rerouting the map. So, you know, we all have those um, devices in our cars or on our phone, you know, we want to visit a new place. We enter the, the, the map coordinates, the, the, the postcode, and it drives us there. And what happens with these patients is they have a fixed postcode. When they think of the dentist, they go to that same journey. They follow that same journey. And that germ journey is very traumatic and very um, physically lived within them, in their mind and body. And that's why they manifest as panic attacks, as an example. So what we need to do is put in a new coordinates and say, no, actually, we're going to go to the new dentist. We're going to see Dr. X, Y, and Z as an example. And those new coordinates then rewire the brain because they've now stored that as a memory rather than a lived experience. And therefore, they can overcome very rapidly their fear. And we see this in patients. We see, you know, I see them in hospital and outside. And it's, 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 it's phenomenal. It's a rev real revolution for these patients. And who doesn't see nervous patients? Every single dentist in the globe. It doesn't matter where you go, from Canada to China, from America to Azerbaijan, Lebanon to India. It doesn't matter where you are. Human beings are human beings. We might look different, have different skin colors and eat different food. But when it comes to the dentist, we're all the same. So if we can learn and work together, and really learn some of these tips, I think it would be amazing um, globally to start a, a, a real movement in really moving um, something that I find so powerful for my patients and the patients around me. So let's take an example. I think this slide really sums up everything I want to say today. So if you just remember this, amazing. So let's take the top middle, sorry, top middle. Let's take the top um, circle where it says the subconscious. So the subconscious is a bit like an autopilot. So for example, you know, you've been, do you've been doing a journey from home to university or home to work every day for 10 years. You can literally put the music on and your mind can be a million miles away and you get home and you think, wow, I wasn't even thinking about the journey because you knew when to stop at that red light. You knew where the corner was. You knew where the bus stop was. You knew where people were crossing. That's your subconscious all autopilot. And we all, we all have that, you know, routine things. You go in the morning to work, you make your coffee, you speak to the nurse, you speak to reception, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the subconscious working. Now, if someone's had a real or a conditioned experience, <clears throat> so for example, uh, we find a lot of parents pass on their, their personal fears to their children. So the, children may have, the child may have never, ever had any dental treatment or an injection. Yeah, the mother or father is so scared and they say, well, you know, if you go and see the dentist, they're going to hurt you and it's going to be really painful and you must sit still and don't move. So what they're doing is they haven't really lived a real experience. They've had a conditioning of an experience. And what that means is that then becomes implanted in the brain so powerfully, just like they've lived the experience. And that's what we call the conditioning response. This therefore sets off a neural pathway in the brain. So every time that child now thinks of the dentist, all they're thinking about is the mother or the father saying, it's going to be painful. You're going to start crying. They're thinking of all those things that happen to them when they get hurt. You know, all those different physiological things that then become really relived. So we see this in children who never had any dentistry. And they sit in the dental chair and they, they're shaking and they're crying. And you ask them why. And they said, well, mommy said you're going to stick a long needle in there and it's going to hurt me. And you know, you have to unwind that. So a lot of the times we, when we treat the children with these techniques, we have the parents completely out of the picture. And a lot of the times the parents need the therapy rather than the child. You know, the mother will come in and say, oh, 
you know, my little daughter, she's she's very scared and da da da. And you remove the mother and you ask the child, are you worried about anything? And they say, well, not really, but my mum keeps saying things. You know, so it's it's very important to be able to manifest and work out where exactly the problem is coming from, especially in children. A lot of the times it's the condition response that they've learned from those loved ones around them that think they're doing something good, but they're actually becoming um, detrimental to that individual's um, fulfillment of their dental um, <clears throat> long-term life, basically. So this neural pathway is set and basically neuroplasticity is a concept whereby the brain can be rewired, you know, and it's a very powerful concept. And basically the hypnotherapist, by accessing the patient's subconscious mind through various techniques, we can reframe that experience of the patient. So for example, someone's lived their dental experience, like we said, it's not stored as a memory, it's stored as a live event. So every time they think of it, it becomes live again. And by the therapy and suggestions in hypnotherapy, we can kind of reset things. You know, we can use the volume button, turn things up, turn things down with the ultimate aim of changing these neural pathways. And once these new neural pathways are reset, that is what then becomes the new program. It's like the new disk in the computer. You take out the old disk, you get rid of that one, and you put the new disk in, and that now becomes the subconscious programming of the mind. It's not that we want to completely get rid of it because you can never erase a memory. We're not aiming to erase people's memories. That's not the point. It's to reprogram them so that becomes a memory. And when the person thinks of that, they don't have all those physiological parameters of making them feel the anxiety and all that comes with that and doesn't allow them then to have whatever dental treatment, medical treatment that they need. So I think that's a quite a nice little way of just sort of summing things up. And that's for the real summary of my talk um, today. So let's say for, take, for example, let's take an example. I think it's important for you to see how this is used. So. Like I said, patients come to us with life and not teeth. So, for example, this, this was a lady who presented, she was referred to us um, by the dentist, um, her general dentist, and she was referred to us. And sadly, you know, she did suffer from severe trauma, from physical and mental abuse from her partner, her ex-partner. And, you know, there are a lot of issues that arise when someone suffered from a form of abuse for the individual because it's very traumatic. So they mistrust people, um, you know, they feel they've lost complete control of things. They completely relive the experience every minute and every waking minute of the day, even when they sleep, they can have nightmares, you know, and there's, there's sort of a, a, what they call it, the Bible, the Bible of classification of mental health. And it's called the DSM and it's in its fifth edition now. If people want to go and look at it, it's, 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 a, it's not light reading and it's not ready to be read. If you want to sort of, fall asleep then you can use it for insomnia but it's basically a classification guide but in there it just it defines you know trauma um as someone who's physically been threatened with something traumatic and some sort of injury or violence and this woman faced a lot of this and you know this is what she presented with and you know this is very common in these patients because they suffer from severe anxiety depression they can't leave the house they binge eat, they're overweight, so they have diabetes, they have blood pressure problems, they have a lot of problems, comorbidities, and they really let themselves go. But, you know, she, she managed to sort of pluck up the courage to go and see a dentist, but she was so petrified um, that she had to be referred to see us in the hospital. And again, her management was very, very complex. I'm going to show you how we tried to manage this lady, and it, it's not easy at all. But, you know, some of the factors that we need to consider um, is this individuals having recurrent distressing dreams related to the trauma? Um, they had what we call dissociative reactions, so flashbacks to the trauma, you know, as they because they keep reliving that trauma, it's not stored as a memory. They have negative beliefs about themselves. They feel they're ugly inside, they feel they're physically ugly. They feel it was their fault that they're the bad person. You know, they become agrophobic. They don't want to go out. They have persistent negative feelings, fear, anger, guilt, shame. Why did it happen to me? Why did this person that they love do something to them? 
Um, you know, and there's just so much going on. They can suffer from claustrophobia. So when they're in the dentists, again, if the dentist closes the door, they can feel very claustrophobic. There's so many feelings that they can relive their trauma. It's very traumatic for them going to the dentist, going to the doctor. So even with a technique of conscious sedation, um, which we're not talking about today, they can basically become dissociated because some of the sedative medication we use work a little bit like alcohol. I don't drink myself, but for people who do, we see this, you know, people who drink a little bit of alcohol, you know, they become nice, relaxed, happy, funny. They may do some jokes here and there. But if people drink too much, we know drinking too much comes with not only the physical elements, but the mental elements of it. They become aggressive. They become angry. You know, they want to fight people. And this is a little bit like sometimes the medications we give. And I always, when I'm teaching the students, I always say with the sedative medications, less is more. Because if you give less, you can then control and assist that patient through your speech and um, using techniques of hypnotherapy, even with sedation. Whereas if you give them too much, they become dissociated and don't know what's going on and become angry and aggressive. And this is what happens with a lot of these patients. They become dissociated and uh, aggressive and angry. So if we look at this, this was a combined technique. So she had had some conscious sedation, intravenous therapy, and she was becoming very, uh, I wouldn't use the word aggressive, but became very uncontrolled, so not cooperative. She kept crying. She kept talking about the past trauma. So basically, you know, the students were unable to do any dentistry. But when I used an, in, a technique of combined, so this is a hypnosedation technique, you know, we can see some of the physiological parameters were reduced. So her blood pressure, sorry, her, her heart rate um, reduced. She had a good level of trance, what we look for um, when we see looking if they're in hypnosis. And, you know, we were able to half the dosage of the medications. So like I say, when nine milligrams, probably she became dissociated, unaware of what was going on. So she was living and reliving the trauma. And the amazing thing is she, she wasn't crying anymore. She didn't cry during the treatment. She wasn't trying to talk and relive the experience. So that's a good cooperation because obviously we need that to be able to do the treatment. So, you know, this combined technique, and this was literally just with one half an hour session with me. We hadn't done many sessions. Um, because I just introduced it to her and said, look, we're not, it's not working with just the sedation alone. Let's try this technique. She was willing to do it. You know, but if she went through a whole series of therapy, we could hopefully get her off the medications and, you know, really benefit her whole, her whole life because hypnotherapy, working of the subconscious, you know, we don't have a whole subconscious just for dental or dentistry. The subconscious is the subconscious of the mind. So if you're giving positive suggestion, it affects that person as a human being. So it, really powerful for the rest of her life. And of course, you know, it, you need to work with the relevant team. So this is um, me and my colleagues in the hospital. And we were treating this lady who, she had quite a pronounced gag reflex. And that in turn brought about the anxiety because she felt like she was going to choke. You know, she had needed to have some wisdom teeth removed. So on the left-hand side, you can see a colleague of mine, um, and he's a psychologist, actually. He's not a hypnotherapist. He's, a psycho he's part of our psychology team. And he was doing a technique of what I described at the beginning, guided imagery. And guided imagery, is a, it's very similar to hypnotherapy. Like I said, there's no black line be between a lot of these things. And he was working her. He did about 12 sessions with her outside of the dental room and brought her to a level where she felt comfortable now, the initial sort of stages we did use, you can see on the right-hand side, we used the nitrous oxide. Um, but basically, towards the last session, I said to her, look, we'll keep the nitrous oxide machine on the side. I don't think you need it, giving a lot of positive suggestions. And she allowed me to take a wisdom tooth out with no gag, and we referred her back to the dentist. So, of course, working with the right team with the relevant skills um, is a big game changer. But us as individual dentists working in our surgeries, we can use a lot of these techniques very successfully. And a lot of you are probably using some of these techniques without you even knowing or coining them as guided imagery or hypnotherapy, because that's what you have to do in your daily practice. You know, you have to use techniques and certain word patterns to relax patients, calm them down. You may, many people might have a, a TV screen in the roof. You may 
let the patient listen to some music all these different things are all adding to that and it's all the different guided things we utilize to make a patient into a very nice and relaxed state um so this was a lady referred to me again she was treated by a dentist with intravenous sedation became control completely uncontrolled they couldn't control her she wouldn't allow treatment she was crying became actually quite aggressive so they stopped the technique they stopped the treatment um and they said could i you know do some therapy with her and we did what was called an anchor collapse technique we don't have the time to obviously go into the each technique but i'm just sort of mentioning a few of them and you know she's done very well um i think she needs a lot more work because she's got a lot of trauma that is taking time to bring out of her which is fine you know some people don't like to release all that or or say that to their, their life traumas but i think without her releasing that we're not going to be able to provide her the full therapy for her to overcome because um she did have some subsequent treatment and one session went really well and one session was very complicated again so she's had about two or three sessions with me been back to her dentist had a, a really good treatment had some restorations composites whatever um but again she needs she needs a bit more help but you know it's it's working fine she was never be able to sit in the chair like that before so we've come quite a long way so where do we go wrong you know and i see this in in dentists who've been practicing for 40 years and i see this in dental students so you know please don't ever use the word to a patient you're going to feel a sharp scratch because what you're doing is you're setting them up now of course i'm not saying ever lie to the patient we never do that but just change the words you're going to feel some heavy pressure coming now that's very different because when the person thinks of pressure pushing pressure if i pushed really really hard on someone's hand or my hand for a long time it would hurt me maybe even like a sharp scratch if i had a sharp nail but we're just changing the terminology we use even a sedated patient i like to use the words we're using the local anesthetic gel we're using the jelly we're using the bubble gum jelly if you've got like a cherry flavored one it doesn't matter use the words like cotton wool for local anesthesia use we're going to use the cooling freezing liquid you know i know one oral surgeon she she has an amazing way of taking teeth out and she didn't even know she was doing hypnotherapy but she was really you know she numbed the patient up the patient was relaxed and you know the figure of eight she was removing a, a lower right six for example and she used this sort of rocking technique so every time she'd move the the forceps rocking she'd get the patient to think about them rocking from side to side and that was taking them into a, into a sort of very deep trance and you know when i said to her well you know actually you're doing some elements of hypnotherapy she didn't even know so like i say most of you are probably doing an element of it it's just we may be taking it to a further stage and it's very something very easy to learn it's not a hidden secret it's not hidden science you know i know all across the globe this is used you know i mean in india i know we're going to have colleagues from india but you know there's a lot of amazing papers there in india and i know colleagues using this in the middle east um in europe you know so it's a very powerful technique which is utilized of course not only in dentistry but i think the dental world we really need to pick up on these things and it will really help us because if you've got a patient in the chair gripping onto the chair you know nervous moving squealing what does that rub on it rubs on it, us you know always tell I always tell the dentist you're the one with the drill in your hand. You know, if the patient moves like this and you cut the tongue, they're not going to blame the patient and say, "Well, the patient moved their tongue." They're going to say, "Well, what were your precautions?" But your drill is at revving at several thousand revolutions a second. If you've got a calm patient, that's going to rub off on you. You know, if you're seeing 10, 20 people a day for 40 years, it's going to take its toll. It's going to take its toll on you, and I think it's very important us especially those of our colleagues who just come into the field if you can focus on these things helping your patients ultimately is going to make your life easier you know and who doesn't want a stress free work environment we're all looking for that so it's a very strong um, technique i think that you can use now this is something i'm not going to dwell on this but this is a a paper i wrote 
in the Society for the Advancement of Anesthesia and Dentistry. So can cl clinical hypnotherapy used as an adjunct or alternative to conscious sedation? And it goes through some, um, this is just one, one part of the paper, just you know, showing some of the stages of hypnotherapy, conscious sedation, general anesthesia. But you can go away and look at that paper up. We're not gonna spend a long time on it. Now, what are some of the phenomena, hypnotic phenomena? So some of the characteristics, obviously we're gonna see relaxation, catalepsy of the patient. Um, they're gonna be more concentrated on something, increased suggestibility. And you know, you can introduce um, aspects of amnesia, hyperamnesia, and even analgesia and anesthesia. These are some of the cognitive characteristics that can be found. Physically, again, you will get muscle relaxation. You may get twitching, fluttering of the eyelids. Eye closure is a key aspect of most of hypnosis, but you know there are people that can have their eyes open. Even children can be in a deep state of hypnosis, but have their eyes fully open. If you were put to put a, a pulse oximeter on them, uh, a blood pressure cuff and um, pulse, if you take the pulse, you'd see these would change. And these may lower and increase. So for example, if you were doing a technique to help someone overcome trauma, they may be, you may be getting to them to envisage the trauma for a short period of time. And obviously during those times, those peaks in elevation of blood pressure pulse would of course increase. And then as they relax down again, these would change. You may get the jaw dropping, head usually drops down. Um, so catalepsy is basically suspended animation. So, you know, you may ask them to do certain movements and their hands um, usually would can, would be in a very relaxed state and may stay in the state that you, you ask them. And of course, their general tone would be significantly much more reduced. Now, this is an amazing colleague of ours, Dr. Bryce Lemar, a friend of mine from France. And, you know, he's phenomenal. He probably uses in a day hypnosis on half the patients in the surgery. That's how, how skilled he is. And you can see patients here on the top left. This is a lady that he was treating for having a wisdom tooth out. Um, he uses technique of hypnoanesthesia, hypnoanalgesia. The other lady on the right-hand side and the gentleman on the bottom left-hand side, they've gone into a, a very deep state of somnambulism where basically they're in a very, very deep hypnosis and he can treat them um, even without local anesthesia through suggestion. And, you know, this is a, a technique on the right-hand side. He shows us hypnoanesthesia and implantology. And it's, 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 it's amazing how, you know, the, the, the power of the mind is, is, is so phenomenal. Right, I've hit practical there and I'm actually going to stop my sh slide sharing for a moment because that's sort of the, the summary of what, what I wanted to talk about. But I know there's usually a lot of questions that people have. So um, I may have stopped a bit early, but I don't know if Dr. Sarah, we want to invite people. And I like to have a bit of a, a discussion here rather than me just talking. You know, it'd be good to to maybe see if people are, are uh, using hypnosis or deep relaxation techniques around the globe um, and maybe open up for some questions and, you know, we can, we can learn together. That's what life is, is a learning process together. Doctor, we don't have any question until now. I think all is clear and well explained. Uh, if anyone has any question, kindly write it in the question and answer box. Yeah, if, yeah, exactly. If anyone has any questions about any of this, anything I've talked about, if they want to, you know, learn more about it, obviously, you know, there are various training institutes globally that people can, people can learn. And, you know, there's different ways of learning hypnotherapy even. You can learn it conventionally. Um, so using it not only for dentistry, but using it to help patients with various life issues, or you can use it for specifically um, the medical and dental field. And, you know, you can take it um, just like when we learn anything in life, you know, when, we, when we're going to dental school, we learn how to take out, you know, easy teeth and we go into surgical extraction as example. So even with hypnotherapy, there are levels you're gonna take it and you're gonna start from the beginning. We all start from the beginning. But just to sort of explain to you, you can do hypnoanalgesia, hypnoanesthesia, where, you know, patients can be basically numbed up just by certain suggestions in the mind um, and not even require any local anesthesia technique. And it's, it's very powerful, it's phenomenal. It's amazing for patients who have needle phobia, 
it's a patients it's amazing for patients who have um this is patients with severe allergy to maybe some of the constituents of the local anesthetic and there are people around the globe who may not have seen them you may have seen them but they have a real um, um physical reaction adverse reaction even an anaphylaxis to certain drugs and they can't have local anesthesia which is detrimental to them um i think some questions have come up are you do you want to go through them with me or how would you like to do that dr sarah you can do this doctor no problem fine okay so we've got a colleague uh dr anshu um it says some tips to begin with to begin with hypnosis techniques some tips to begin with okay i mean look very simply when you have the patient in the chair this is something we can all do get them to close their eyes and most people have been to a beach doesn't matter where the beach is get them to close their eyes and get them to imagine with each breath in that the the tide is coming in the water is coming in and as they breathe out the tide is going out okay and maybe do that for a minute or two and do it with them you know do the breathing technique it helps you to relax as well and that's the sort of and that can be used as an induction getting them into a nice deep relaxed state getting them to close their eyes they become very relaxed and it can take them it will just basically allows their mind to wander and you can sort of gauge from that roughly if they um have any ability to um what's the word they have to have a good imagination because if some people don't have an imagination then you need to already describe things and you need to describe things in detail but generally in hypnosis we don't we try to make things quite vague because for example if you told someone to think of a beach and they thought of a pebbly beach and then you start talking about the sand if there's no sand there they'll think oh my god something's gone wrong so we generally keep things quite open because the mind each individual mind will want to wonder where it wants to wonder and that's what hypnosis is so keep things vague but you know a favorite place of relaxation maybe that you can imagine them to think of a garden something like that works very well just for a minute breathing technique in out and then count down from 10 to 1 so i'm going to count down from 10 to 1 and when we get to 1 you're going to be in a completely relaxed state you'll hear me working around you and we're going to start the dentistry but you're going to be in a quite relaxed state that's a very simple simple way of doing it now it says dr avnish says what are the methods of hypnosis um so hypnosis has various parts to it so for example even in general anesthesia if we talk about general anesthesia there would be the induction process there would be the maintenance and the recovery similarly in hypnosis there so the stages are getting someone induced into a hypnotic state we then do what's called a deepener and then we give the suggestions and what would be called the emerging awakening so there are various even in the terms of inductions just like you can use various drugs for anesthesia and sedation we can use various techniques for guiding a person through the induction and the induction can be through a relaxation technique um it can be sort of a slow progress you can do rapid inductions you can do um um immediate inductions snap inductions so there are different ways of doing it and different settings call for different things so people in stage hypnosis and that may use a very rapid technique we might use a little bit slow one because it seems seems less aggressive in a in a clinical environment but i think some of the stuff that stage hypnosis hypnosis to a very powerful and actually very useful for us to maybe adapt slightly um but to make someone go into a very deep black state now what our, our colleague dr ganjan thank you for excellent question it says how can we apply hypnotherapy to children children are amazing between 0 and 7 they say this is the time when they you know the the, the medical sort of and papers say that every human being is in a state of hypnosis because children are just absorbing you know children are always asking why 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 is this why is that why is that and you know children have imaginary friends they play games and that's how you can apply hypnotherapy to children is you need to go into their world so you can ask them what's your latest cartoon you're watching what's your favorite tv channel what's your favorite game and play the game with them and that's if especially between 0 and 7 they're in a state of hypnosis so you don't have to do a lot to make them very relaxed and make them comfortable you know so applying hypnotherapy to children is very powerful 
it's an amazing technique but get into their world when you're in their world and they trust you it's 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 phenomenal you, you it's already um amazing technique and i haven't gone into details but we're just sort of touching on things so Dr. Najmadeen, thank you for your question. It says, can you elaborate on the difference between hypnoanesthesia and glove anesthesia? Well, it's a sort of the same thing, really, because inducing uh, someone into glove anesthesia and then using that to transfer that, whether that's going to be for dentistry or for other pain or other ailments, you know, if someone's able to follow those instructions to go into that state of hypnosis, then of course, using um, hypnoanesthesia to an extent um, is using it very specifically. You can transfer that glove analgesia, for example, um, into uh, the oral cavity for dentistry and even take it further to the state where it's full, full analgesia, full analgesia, you know, where the patient will not feel any uh, discomfort or pain. And, you know, we know patients who've had um extractions you know under this technique hypnoanesthesia um, but glove anal anal anesthesia is a is a technique of utilizing that to transfer that around the body um great i think those are the the questions that came up so i hope everybody enjoyed it and um yeah it'd be great to get feedback to dr sarah thank you yeah thank you doctor for this great session Thank you for inviting me. It was an honor. Really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Thank you so much for everything. No problem. And I think we might meet again if we plan some other sessions. <laughs> yes, of course. No problem at all. We'll be, we'll be glad to have you with us again. Thank you very much. You take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.